Today, we are in the village of Ankrum in the Borders to explore a little of its history and learn about a few of the people associated with the area. Welcome to Exploring Scotland's History. It shouldn't come as any surprise to those that frequent the channel to find out that we will begin our visit in a cemetery. For my couple of evening visits here, I was accompanied by a couple of the members of Ankrum and District Heritage Society, both very passionate and knowledgeable on the area. The old church is locally known as Livingston Church, a nod to its minister from 1648 to 1662, John Livingston, a well-known covenanter who had preached in Kalinchy in Northern Ireland before returning to Scotland to support the covenanter cause against Charles I. The remains we see today were built in 1762 on the site of a much earlier place of worship. The first headstone my new friends draw my attention to is one of Walter Potter. This was Beatrice Potter's brother. He had a farm quite close to the graveyard. Beatrice had much inspiration from the farm, its garden and surrounding areas. Now we move on to something which has much more age to it, a stunning hogback stone, quite rare in Scotland. We viewed one on the Isle of Bute. This stone was uplifted by antiquarians in 1922. It is presumed to be early 12th century. Although described as a hogback, i.e. its shape, these stones were often carved with an almost scaly appearance to mimic the roof tiles on a Norse house. Ankrum and District Heritage Society have spent a lot of time and energy to ensure this stone gets the protection it needs. Close by are the church remains, enveloped in ivy and creepers. They also have an annex which would have served as a schoolroom. Within the church is this recumbent slab with a mysterious carving at the top. Maybe. I have searched my reference books to find a similar carving with little success. I am aware that a surgeon would have occasionally had a bowl or bleeding bowl carved on his headstone, but these were extremely rare. If any of you can shed any light on this, please leave a comment below. Heading out the back of the church is a row of lime trees. They are planted on the site of a cholera pit from the epidemic of 1849. Many Irish navvies were interred here. They were building the Waverley Railway Line. Cholera is an infection brought on by ingesting food or water containing the Vibrio cholera bacterium. Poor hygiene and cramped living conditions spread this disease to epidemic proportions. If not treated, it can be fatal within a matter of hours. Here we also see what is probably a stone to hold a wooden cross. In my eyes I see a roughly cut font similar to the one we explored at the Fort and Gaul U site. Another notable grave is that of William Rutherford. He was a professor of psychology in the University of Edinburgh for 25 years. He taught when Arthur Conan Doyle attended. It said Doyle's Professor Challenger is based on him. He was an elected member of the Escoplian Club, one of the oldest medical dining clubs in the world. Heading out the back of the churchyard, we cross over the Eel Water via the King's Highway, which ran the whole way from York right through to Edinburgh. The medieval bridge was widened in the 19th century. Ankrum was a busy coaching post in its days gone by. Overlooking the road is Castle Hill, site of an Iron Age fort with two standing stones as well. Local tales say it's the site of the witch burnings. Returning back through the graveyard and we head to the centre of the village before it gets too dark. 
There are many more interesting historic sites around Ancrum and I imagine this won't be my last visit. Ancrum has a central village green which has the remains of a market cross, the war memorial and the foundation stones of the original school site. But here's the current school, built in 1866. The clock was donated by John Payton. He was the son of an Ancrum minister who moved to New York to succeed in business. We can also find a random sundial jauntily built into an old wall, really quite odd. The village is stunning and I look forward to my return. Outside the village we visited a stunning mausoleum with an interesting history. This is the Monteith Mausoleum and it sits on top of Gerset Law giving stunning panoramic views of the surrounding area including the site of the Battle of Ancrum Moor and the Waterloo Monument. The mausoleum is stunning, guarded by two stone lions, although one is strangely asleep. Within, two magnificently carved angels guard the tomb, below a gorgeous ceiling covered in star-shaped apertures. But who was Monteith? Monteith was born at Hanover, Jamaica, son of Thomas Monteith of Kipple. Monteith entered the East India Company as a cadet when he was 17. The next year he became an ensign in the Bengal Army, who he served with throughout his career. Despite being injured on two occasions, he served in the various colonial campaigns against India, including Bundakland, Gurkha and Nepal. In 1821 he was promoted to captain. He took part in the siege and assault at Bharatpur, successful for the colonial forces. By 1834 he had risen to lieutenant colonel and commanded his regiment through the First Anglo-Afghan War of 1838-42. He may have had a few successes at the beginning of the campaign but the end result was one of the worst military disasters of the 19th century with the colonial forces withdrawing. Britain had felt the need to secure Afghanistan to protect their interests in India from the Russian invasion. His conduct earned him the role of aide-de-camp to the Queen in 1842. By 1846 he had command of the Indian district of Ambala, ranking as brigadier. He would leave India that year. Despite never returning to India, he still moved up the military ranks. On his return home, he settled in Stone Byers in Lanarkshire. In 1864, he commissioned his mausoleum through Petty and Kinnear, a pair of eminent architects from Edinburgh. It was completed for his passing in 1868. The stunning ceiling design with its 48 stars is a definite nod to his decades in Bengal. He had no direct links to Ancrum aside from the fact his son-in-law owned the land that he chose to build on. His mausoleum was never to be opened. Today you can acquire a key to fuel splendour thanks to the friends of Monteith Mausoleum. They have worked tirelessly to get this site to where it is today. I'd like to thank my guides from Ancrum Heritage who made my visit all the more enjoyable. I leave links to both Ancrum and Monteith groups below. If you enjoyed the video, please like, subscribe and comment. It really helps the channel grow. Thanks to everyone who supports the channel via the coffee page. Until next time, thank you for joining us on Exploring Scotland's History.